Hello team and welcome back to another podcast, another episode on the Live Perform Compete. Today I'm joined with my very, very good friend, Andrew Russell, is currently sat somewhere in China in a bubble, uh, playing in the first division of the China Super League. Andrew, welcome. Thank you, Edward. Nice to be here. Uh, Andrew, it's great, great to have you here. We, we, spend, we, spend, we have many a long conversation talking about sport, training, mindset, psychology, uh, and much of our conversations evolve around you as our case study because you've, um, <laughs> you've, qu- you've had quite the journey. And if I was to summarize it for our listeners, uh, you know, born, not quite born and raised, but essentially raised a lot of your time in Hong Kong. You know, we grew up together. Then off you go mm-hmm. to university in the UK. Uh, you eventually end up playing non-league football, uh, which for, for, for anyone who doesn't know much about football, that is below the conference division. Um, so you were there and then you, you came back to Hong Kong, did a stint in the first division. Then you flew to Malaysia and played for Penang FC in their, in their premier competition. Back to Hong Kong. And then here you are, age 32, playing in the China Super League. Um, went over to the first division. Then you moved to the Super League, and now you're currently on loan at Jiangxi. Anyway, how did I do with that introduction? Yeah, not bad. Um, um, yeah, so I think, you know, I know where this conversation is going to go because I know a lot of the conversations that we've had. But perhaps, Russell, to start, talk us through that journey and how it's brought you to here today. Yeah, you summarized it pretty well. Um, I grew up in Hong Kong. I moved to Hong Kong, I guess, like most of us, with because of my dad's job. That was I was two years old then, so I grew up um, with yourself. Up to university, went to university, played a lot of football uh, at university, both for the university itself and then outside and non-league and and even Sunday league as well. And that kind of gave me first exposure to. I think probably one thing that we'll get onto a lot, which I've discovered when we speak about mindset is probably the limitations and sometimes having a kind of privileged expat life. I think it certainly has held me back within my career. I don't know. You can, you can allude to that as well within your career and and what your experience with people in CrossFit. Um, And so then that was kind of my first exposure when I was in the UK to real tough tough football i think when you're living within within hong kong everything is so easy if you look back at the times when we when we play football you know whether it be that whether it be at school whether it be at the football club we we always played you know we we always started we always were probably the better players within the team we never had any real experience to failure or setbacks or you know, really having to push ourselves to understand how good we could be because we were in such a small pond. We were, I guess, essentially big, not even big fish. We were just fish in a tiny, minute pond and kind of our mediocre approach, I guess that's what you could call it, down at Sandy Bay, our mediocre approach to training, our mediocre approach to, you know, things that we probably never even thought about, mindset, um, all that stuff was good enough. And then I think probably when I went away to university, as I, I mean, if you look at how many guys we went to school with, um, guys and girls, you know, how many of them immediately stop playing sports when they get to university? Because it's probably the first time they have ever experienced people saying, no, no, you're not good enough, real setbacks. And that kind of expat life never prepared. I mean, we used to think, you know, I, I uh, might get lost on a lot of people who are listening to this, but we we used to have our under 14 or under 16 coach, Anto. And we, we, we used to think he was a crazy dictator and he was so strict on us and he was so hard and, and he, and, you know, he, he was so tough on us. And then, you know, it pales into absolute insignificance into what my experiences have been kind of in the real world and, and playing football um, in the UK and then, and then across Asia. Um, so, so from that, you know that kind of background in in Hong Kong. I played again in U- at university f- for a few years, and then went back to Hong Kong play for one season. Then I got into it. Um, I was playing non league, and then effectively it's like the Northern Premiership. So for people who wouldn't understand UK football, it's like semi professional. So you're going to train or play on a Tuesday, 
then you'll train very light on a Thursday night and then you'll play on the Saturday. And then, you, you know, your home or away games, your home games, obviously your home games, and then your away games, you could be traveling anywhere from 45 minutes to four or five hours away within, I was, I was living in Manchester at the time, so anywhere across the north of the UK. Um, and that was, that was certainly a very different experience to um, what, what I'd had when I was in Hong Kong and, and living living in Hong Kong and playing in Hong Kong. Um, and then along, so it was, it was only semi-professional, so every, uh, everyone would also have a job as well as playing football on the side. And it was, I think, I, have a, I, have a, I was fortunate enough to, uh, it was actually probably the first person was my now wife. Uh, fast forward to about 2014, I was kind of coasting along in a, in a be perfectly honest, pointless job, easy, easy sales job, playing my football, never without really pushing myself on, uh, on either front really, because I think if you're going to do something well, which I guess you'll know very well, every, you know, you have to give that all your focus. And that was never me. I wanted to play my football, but I was never really totally committing to it. But then it was enough of a distraction that I never once tried a leg when in my proper nine to five job. And I always knew, well, I'm not going to do any extra work because I need to be at training or I'm not going to stay behind because I have to shoot off to a game or whatever it might be. Um, and it was, so I probably got to the age of about 24, 25, it would have been, and it was when my now wife, Helen, who you know well, she was probably the first person who said, like, you know, started challenging me to say, well, what, what do you want? Do you want to make, do you want to pursue this football? Do you not? And at that time, of course, Helen didn't really understand football, but she was then saying, you know, get, get a DVD together, send your DVD to clubs. You know, but if, in, it, it was her way of saying, like, do something about it. If you're going to, if you want to do this, um, and she actually, through the help of her, one of her friends, uh, play uh, one of her friend's boyfriend. Um, he was playing, I think, I can't remember which team he was playing for, but he was playing in the football league for maybe Swindon at the time. And he had a guy who, he wasn't really an agent, but that's how he kind of got described to me um, as an agent. Um, and and um, he's still, he's, just, that was the, uh, that's how I first got in touch with him. And, and to be honest, he's been my mentor ever since. So how it worked is he, the, the kind of initial conversation was around, he was, an, he was maybe an agent, but he was going to help me get a DVD together. And uh, from there, we were going to look at what clubs we could go to. So I go around to his house to pick up, uh, pick up this DVD. I never forget it was in his kitchen. And he was really the first person who challenged me to say, well, what are your goals? And that's why I think well, you definitely won't remember. On my wedding day, when I was getting all soppy about Helen, I said, oh, you know, I was sleepwalking through my 20s. And that's effectively what I was doing. I was in this dead end job, you know, where football world was going absolutely nowhere, really. Um, and, and kind of through those two people, they sort of challenged me to say, well, what? what do you want? What are your goals? And then that's when the kind of from that, the idea was, well, I really want to play football professional. I don't really care about the money because I just know if I could really commit to the football as my full-time job, it would free up all my other time to then start improving in practicing and going to the gym more and, you know, doing all these things that I wasn't doing at the time. Um, so once I had the goal, which was the first time we sound it sounds kind of crazy now when i when I look back or would sound absolutely crazy for someone like yourself with, with your business and, and what you've done in, in CrossFit, but I never had a goal never never had a goal of what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go or what I wanted to achieve, and that was the first time midway through my twenties I went right no that's the first step I, okay, I want to be a professional footballer right well where are you going to do that what's how are you going to do that? Could you go to we were throwing all sorts of things this is you know, first, what about the second division in Scotland? What about Norway? What about, and then at that time, um, our other friend, Jack Seeley, 
he had just finished playing in the Barclays Asia Trophy for South China against Man City, Man City and Tottenham, I think they played for, and that had actually been on Sky Sports. And I thought, well, you know, I could go back to, I, I, I count as a local player in Hong Kong. Um, that, I mean, I'm, I'm not getting any of those experiences that Jack was getting. And I thought, I'll fancy a bit of that. And that's where the ball started rolling, started speaking to teams in Hong Kong. Um, and that's when I got my first move to, after a successful like two week trial as a, lo- as a local player, uh, I signed for South China, was there for two, two and a half years. Um, and at that time, I felt I'd out, not outgrown, but I was, I was, I wanted a new challenge. I wanted a new experience at that time. China wasn't an option. So I started looking at other avenues. Uh, Malaysia looked an amazing experience in, in how many fans they get at games. And at that time they had a, a English coach at Penang, a guy called Ashley Westwood. But in terms of how he'd set the club up and the, and the professionalism and, and processes that he'd set in place was, was absolutely perfect for me. Um, it was a great fit. So moved out there. <laughs> Unfortunately, maybe we'll go into it a little bit later. It was an absolute disaster. I think we lost the first six games in a row and we didn't score a goal. Uh, so then I he got sacked and then pretty much I was struggling with a bone bruising in my knee. But still trying to play because at that point we knew every game that he that he didn't that he didn't um, every game sorry if if we lost he was probably on his way out so I was trying to play through this injury and then in the end he he got the sack and then I never played again I was injured for a month and they I had a one year contract but they paid because they I was taking up one of their foreign spots. They they cut the contract short to bring other players in. I was back to Hong Kong for half a season uh, with Taipo, and then they che- in March of 2016. I'd assumed my Hong Kong passport then. So at the beginning of 2018, they made some amendments to the rules with regards to Hong Kong players being allowed to play in China, which I fit the criteria. And that's how I got my move to Liaoning first, and then after a good a successful season with Liaoning my uh, move to Hebei in the Super League, um, which was a difficult year last year. Uh, I think well, that's where I l- probably all of my main lessons were learned. I'm sure it's something we'll speak about a lot here. And then that's brought me with this, obviously there's loads of difficulties at the beginning of the year with COVID and so on and so forth. Uh, but an opportunity arose to come to the current team I'm at J- Jiangxi on loan um, and play here. So that's an absolutely mammoth description bored everyone to death with uh, how it started and kind of kind of where I am now yeah uh, I mean it's actually funny you know we speak all the time I've known you forever but never actually heard the whole piece put together chronologically from you know <laughs> university it's boring isn't it it's well it's not it's actually it's just I think the thing that that amazes me in hearing it is that you know, when you think of professional sports and you think about professional athletes and, you know, you're paying it, you know, in one of the highest paid football divisions in the world, like the Super League, is that, you know, we, we create this, uh, this story that to get to that level, you know, you, you have to have been living and breathing the sport from probably a very, very young age. It's probably a combination yeah. of, of talent, but also opportunity. And then, you know, we probably foresee these people making their way through the ranks and then, you know, they've worked their way up the ladder like we do in the insurance industry or anything else. And then yeah. you know, we're now on the Super League. But then your story is actually completely different. Like, firstly, you're a Hong Kong kid. And I think for context for listeners, like, Hong Kong kids in sport don't really, <laughs> like, you know, we're not, we're not renowned for our sport and prowess. And there's not no. a lot of us around the world who are kind of making strides in what we do. So that's the first piece. And then secondly, that I remember it all happening. But, like, being in your mid-20s, you know, living in, the north of England, not really striving to play high-level football that much and being quite content with, I guess, what, mm. what we could probably say is a, a comfortable life. And then, you yeah. know, making a decision, which is already very late for, for most professional athletes, to say, you know, actually, no, I do want to give this a go and try the whole professional route. And yeah. fast forward four to five years, like, you're there living your dream um, in China. And it's just, I don't know, it's just amazing to see how it's all just kind of happened. Yeah, I think I think you alluded to it there. I think a lot of people, I don't like people who talk about luck 
um, as, as being a factor. But I mean, in my instance, it has, I don't want to, I uh, might get lost on people from the CrossFit background, but I don't want to put myself as, as this Jamie Vardy type guy who now is one of the, you know, of course I, I improve exponentially since turning professional and I've worked incredibly hard, but I'm also incredibly fortunate. I grew up in Hong Kong that allowed me to play in Hong Kong. And then as a result has allowed me to play as a local player in China. So that's important to mention, but yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting journey. It's a, certainly a different journey. Yeah. And I always, you know, I always, always think back to us growing up and like, you know, you talked about like the big fish in a small pond. That's exactly what it was in Hong Kong. I certainly felt yeah. for myself, like there was never any need to have to do more than we already were because we were yeah. playing for the best teams. We were winning all the best competitions and we were probably yeah. held in quite high regard here, but like you were always a little bit different. And I remember probably, you know, GCSE time for us, which would have been 14, 15. I remember you first, you turning a new leaf with regards to your commitment to education and basically started you know, working a lot harder when it came to exam times yeah. and put the work in the year. And you, you, know, you were the only person kind of in our friendship group to kind of make that change and to make that commitment yourself and basically to come to all of us as your close mates who are you know, not doing a whole lot with our lives, to be honest. <laughs> and the absolute bare minimum was like, you know, I'm going to start stepping up my game here and really trying harder and and you start to see, we all start to see amazing results happen with, with your education side. And it was just a matter of time before that mindset, you know, transferred to something else in your life. And that was football. And, you know, mm. like, you know, whilst you say like a, we're a big fish in a small pond, you still, you were like, you know, making strides as a 16 year old playing in the first division in Hong Kong already, whilst none of, none of the rest of us were. So in actual fact, it's actually no surprise that this has all happened because you just had a different mindset and you had this kind of need and desire to want to do more than what you had. And I know you're probably going to say you wish you did more if you were to do it yeah. all again, but you know, you certainly had that which separated you from the rest of us. Yeah. But I think yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. Cause I was literally about to say, like when I think back to growing up and I, I think, I just think, wow, so much wasted opportunity um so much wasted time like i say i was probably doing a little bit more than others but the <laughs> if we're talking about sports the, the the bar was so low that in terms of doing more than others that that's certainly uh certainly nothing to write home about but then it went through to when i was playing non-league as well and now and now i know what i know and i live how i live my life now and all the processes that i follow now and i think wow if i'd have actually done that throughout my childhood or when I was playing non-league, then what, what could I have achieved? But I think what's important is like, I, I mentioned there a reference about goals. Well, when we grew up, there was no example really of anyone who'd lived in Hong Kong and then gone and had a successful sports career. It didn't really, that, that kind of goal or idea didn't, didn't really exist. You followed the norm. And the norm was you went, you know, you went to school, then you went to a university, whether it be in America, Canada, Australia, or the UK, you got your degree and then, and then you started work. Um, it'd be interesting if I'd have seen someone like myself, because there's, there's been a few people now who've from, from ESF schools or international schools, sorry, I should say, that have now gone on to play internationally for Hong Kong in football and, and played internationally for Hong Kong in rugby or now indeed in CrossFit. And if I had it, if that had been, if that, I mean, that just didn't exist when we were in school, mm. but if it, if it did, could I have said, yeah, no, I want, I want that to be me. I'm, I'm going to go and find an avenue and I'm going to go to such and such football school in the UK and improve. And because I'm going to one day play for Hong Kong, it, it didn't exist. So the goal wasn't mm. really there to happen. Yeah, I've, I feel like we were probably almost kind of like the first generation of, of kids to start, you know, making strides in, in sport, yeah. you know, whether it just be in Hong Kong. Because, I mean, something you didn't mention as well is that you've represented the Hong Kong national team in football for many oh, years yeah. now as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay, I mean, something that we've talked a lot about, Russell, is your, uh, is your journey to Malaysia. So kind of like your first time... Yeah 
you know, after coming back to Hong Kong and establishing yourself with South China yeah. in the top division here, you know, you took the plunge to, to kind of step out of your comfort zone, move to a professional yeah. setup in Malaysia. And I def and I know and I know it wasn't the fairy tale story that you'd imagined it was gonna be. So talk us through that yeah. experience. Well what happened was at the time yeah, sorry, we t- we totally skimmed over the whole <laughs> the Hong Kong stuff. But I so I had assumed my Hong Kong passport in the March of twenty sixteen made my debut against Qatar. Um but how it works with football and especially football in Asia is you either classified as a local player and then I think in every league in Asia in Asia there's a there's a limitation as to how many foreign players you can sign. And then there's stipulations as to how many within that, say for example, in most countries it's what you can have four foreigners. And within that, one of them generally has to be Asia from as as an Asian passport. So when they are the avenue of not going to China, there wasn't the avenue to go to China. So I'd look around and I saw I came across a couple of videos on YouTube and I was watching teams come into into the stadium and, and there were you know there was fans for the you know the as far as the eye could see and they had flares and they were chanting and then I was watching these cup finals and there was seventy to ninety thousand fans there and I'm thinking yeah yeah that's amazing that's 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 class I know that when I've played when my adrenaline's been up and I've played for Hong Kong or I've played for in big stadiums that's when I've generally played my best so I know I'll go there and do well and that's kind of then that that goal became that became my focus that became a goal I want to play in in the, in the Malaysian Super League I actually used to have a piece of paper like a sheet that I had written down the certain goals that I wanted to achieve and like how I was what processes and I used to read it every day when I was brushing my teeth um and literally number one on that sheet was to play in the Malaysian Super League so that would have been 2016 and then uh, sort of came to fruition that I did play in 2017 but I only I only ever looked at the positives how amazing this is going to be how amazing you play in front of all these fans amazing imagine when you win imagine I never thought about what happens when you lose because I'd I'd played for teams in the UK where you know maximum you're going to play in front of 2000 3000 people then you come back to hong kong and you got more pressure and then you play for hong kong but it's the same sort of thing you're, you're only playing in front of a thousand two thousand so then i go to malaysia and that all of a sudden becomes twenty five thousand. so you might have received a little bit of criticism or you might have received two or three negative comments on Facebook about your performance or you can't believe that someone's wrote, can't believe Russell got selected for Hong Kong. Maybe five people wrote that or something on the Facebook. Well, you go into a big club with a big set of fans and you're, and you're not doing well. All of a sudden there's hundreds of comments that, yeah. And that was, even though, as you say, I could, because I started my football journey so late that that volume of negativity, I'd never had, as we've kind of alluded to before, my upbringing certainly hadn't prepared me for it. You know, playing in the UK and playing in a small league in Hong Kong certainly hadn't prepared me for it. And then all of a sudden you're thrown into this environment where your team is struggling and you are receiving a lot of criticism. And uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was certainly a challenge. And like, what and, to to what to what extent did that did that criticism come? Is it like is this are these comments on a on a fan site? Are these like letters getting posted through your doors? Are these like, this, um, but both really, and, and so there was a lot of lessons. I mean, I had an Australian teammate, and I mean, he got it worse than me. But I mean, we're talking about we went out to play a home game. And I'll never forget it for as long as I live. This this banner must have been six foot by ten foot, and it said, "Diogo, you're a parasite. Please go home or stay on the no." Diogo, you're a parasite. Stay on the bench. That's a home game. So these fans have gone out their way to make this huge banner for my like my teammate, and then we played the first half. He played every time he touched the ball. All the all the fans were booing him. So the coach had no choice but to bring him off. Um, so I never got it to that kind of intensity. But at the same time, 
I lost count. I don't know how many to how many. To, but I was stupid. I was, I was naive and I was a little bit insecure at that time. And so, I also went looking for. You know, when we'd finish a game you know they'd put the result on facebook or the pictures and then there'd be hundreds of comments well i'm stupidly going through all the comments and reading them and seeing russell that are the need to change the, um you know and all, all lessons in hindsight now that i should never have been actively engaging in that and and i'm and i should have been controlling what i should have controlled i should have you know i should have managed or tried to understand what i want my reaction to be to that criticism which is is kind of what we'll get onto now, and kind of where I am and where where I am now as a as a person and as a player. Um, but no, at that time it was it was difficult. And then at the other, the same time I was I I, I wasn't one hundred percent fit when I went, but the opportunity had arisen. It wasn't the right time for me to go. Um, and then I lasted five or six games, injured my knee, but then maybe played for another three or four totally not fit trying to keep the manager's job um and do myself even further disservice uh on the pitch with kind of all that added pressure i'd put on myself so it was um yeah to put it bluntly it was an absolute disaster but you learn and that 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 also goes for last year as well which i'm sure we'll get onto later but when you're in that's what i've found is when you're in those difficult moments as long as you persist and as long as you keep following the right processes and, and as long as you keep looking at how you could address that particular situation better, then you will eventually come out of it the, the other side. And that was a big thing that I did learn because when I came back, I signed for, after Malaysia, I signed for a team called Taipo in, in Hong Kong Premier League. And by that point, I'd not played for three months maybe i'd done little bits of training but it's, it's i don't know if it's the same for crossfit but it's never the same you know when you're actually playing in games and i just didn't matter how much work i'd done in the gym um i just wasn't i wasn't agile i wasn't mobile I was, I was just a little bit sluggish in my movements and that really taught me because i just every day i kept persisting every day i'd work with the fitness coach after training for 10 15 minutes fast feet and then so that when the season started in from when the season started in about September, fast forward to probably the November time, um, I played for Hong Kong against Lebanon. And that was probably the best game I'd ever played. And that was the game that effectively helped me get my move to China. But from where I'd arrived in Hong Kong, I'd learned just day from where I'd arrived at Taipo and I wasn't in great form and I, I'd obviously... I was building up my confidence as well as building up my physical capabilities, but just trusting in that day by day and being consistent allowed me to get in that place to play as I did in November, which then ultimately allowed me to go on to China and, and you know, totally change my life. <clears throat> okay. So you, you talked about processes. You mentioned, you mentioned the word process a lot of times. And I think just for some context here, like you've always been, you know, before even Malaysia and that opportunity came along, you were investing a lot of time mm -hmm. in the psychology side yeah. of the game. You know, I know you'd invested yeah. in a sports psychologist. You've been reading a lot of books. You've been listening to a lot of talks yeah. on YouTube's and podcasts. Maybe mm -hmm. like, I'd like, I'd like to know like what first brought you to the idea of sports psychology. Um, yeah. And then I'd love to hear about, you know, when you keep on talking about processes, what are the processes yeah. that you go through when you're dealing with, you know, all this negative news from the outside world? Yeah. And, you know, how do you stay on track and stay focused on what you did not let that distract you? Yeah. Um, you'll have to remind me on the process one because that's a big one, but I'm sure I'll waffle on too much that I'll forget. But on the psychology side, that was when we were playing for the university team, one of the assistant coaches, I think he'd done a degree in – psychology or sports psychology and he was the first one who introduced the team to the team and then effectively me into very just the, you know real basic sports psychology concepts whether it be uh, visualization pos positive self-talk and I got a lot I got a lot from um, I got a lot from those conversations and then carried carried on with that and I, I think for me and, and I think if some people dismiss sports psychology. Some people think it's rubbish. People, I think it's getting more and more traction and, and there's loads and loads more at the moment about 
mental health and and kind of the importance of the mind and well-being and not just in sports but in everyday life but i think what i found was one day and i'm sure <laughs> never more prevalent than what happened in my debut with Hebei and and my time at Hebei but one minute in one game I'd be absolutely fantastic and everything would feel effort, effortless and and I'd feel confident and things wouldn't phase me and then in the next game or two games you know I, w- I wouldn't be quite the same player or I had a tendency in games and, and, and still something I'm working on now where one mistake two mistakes would quickly snowball in you know I could fall off a cliff um in terms of performance wise and and that was uh, had everything to do with the mind my mindset and and psychology so i've it's something i've always been a big believer in to be honest i think if in, with my goals now my hope is that i will finish playing i hopefully play for another 2 3 more years and then i will want to myself then go and become a sports psychologist and help people because I, that's how that's how important a factor it is and i think it's, it's because people want to you you you'd go to the gym to train your muscles why would you not then train your mind and i think the mind controls everything we think about like i certainly thought about it from a perspective where you know i want to i want to play better i want thing but things that i've never lacked which might be work ethic well, that all still comes from the mind as well so when when people aren't putting the work in in other areas the gym and, and so on and so forth for me personally i believe that's within the mind as well that's where it all starts so i'm also fascinated for when i finish my career i think i know some things i know i've made so many mistakes i know by just kind of trial and error some things have worked for me so i've mindset wise i've continued and i really look forward to the day when i actually un- study it and properly understand the theory and practice oh well that's why that's happened that's why that happened and, and, and really put some science behind kind of the thoughts um that i've had i think some someone once gave me the, i've never forgot it, it was I'm literally going all the way back to 2008 and I was talking to a coach when I was in the UK and he said, and we were talking about a player saying, oh, he's, he's struggled. He's not doing well. And he, and he said to me, I've never forgot it because it probably resonates so much with me. He said, he's too intelligent for football. I was like, what? He said, he's too intelligent for football. He overthinks everything. He wants to find an answer why that happened or he, you know he's worrying about things or he where he says some people they just rock up they play they don't give it too much thought and they go home you know other people want to overthink everything and bring it home with them and oh god and have real perfectionist tendencies with it and that's always been me and always been my problem so um i think that's massive it's something i'm still working on now i think with all the difficulties that i had last year um I've, I've learned so much on um and i'm sure we'll touch on that a little yeah, bit later I'll, I'll right. actually, i want to really just quickly jump in there because you know yeah. the, the it, i was actually the, the next question on the tip of my tongue was going to be about you know there's that fine point that's behind understanding the fine line between understanding sports psychology and how to get the most out of it versus overthinking it and, you know, like yeah. the best performances happen when we're in that, that kind of flow state where we're just yeah. so present on the task at hand. And that can be at training yeah. or when you're doing your extra practice or in a gym or when it's actually on the field of competing versus, you know, the state that you're talking about, which is where you're thinking about, you're overthinking yeah. about everything from like how you look to your next play to like how you control the yeah. football. When you know that those are all things you do naturally. And we were just talking yeah. about this on the podcast because I know we share quite a lot of podcasts that we find interesting because I know yeah. we know what we're both interested in, but we you know Johnny Wilkinson, you know, England yeah. world cup winner, you know, widely regarded as one of the best fly halves in, in international rugby yeah. to ever play has just put out a podcast really talking about this. And, you know, he was talking about his obsession, his, his, you know, 
severe obsession with perfection um, yeah. and just, just how much he thought about performance and this, his reputation of wanting to be the best player in the world and how, how much that took him out of the present moment and didn't actually yeah. allow him to be the best he could be. And, and for him now, in hindsight, looking back on his career, it took so much enjoyment out of his life because yeah. he was so one-track minded, couldn't do it. So, you know, I guess this now comes on to talking about you and your processes. You know, I know you've listened to that podcast. And I know that podcast probably threw a few spanners, spanners in your works in terms <laughs> of the way that you think because it, it, it pulls somewhat contrast the idea of just get your head down and work really, really, really hard all the time. Um, but yeah. you know what are what are your processes? Because you know we've had some amazing athletes on this podcast who admittedly say that they struggle with that, especially in some a sport like CrossFit, for example, which is a little bit newer. Yeah. And so you know people are coming into the professional game almost every year. There's new people in the spotlight and the limelight who are on yeah. TV and social media, and and you know one of their biggest struggles is knowing how to handle the expectation and the pressure. So what what are the yeah. processes that you've learned now? you know, and you'll continue yeah, to work on. As, as we kind of alluded to in the, in, the, in I've had to learn, because not only has my football career, relatively speaking, as a professional and as an international, as an international, albeit only, well, but only for Hong Kong, um, has been so short. So you're learning everything late and having to fit so much, so many learnings that people, if I'd, lived in the UK or I'd gone you know I should really have been in an academy from eight to whenever I eventually made it to the first team or went and played first team and within that journey I'd have learned not to listen to what others say to to have goals to to only control what I can control so on and so forth um to not you know to not worry about what others are thinking all those things I'm having to kind of cram it all in in a short amount of time um for me the biggest lesson was probably that was about keeping everything rational and keeping a blueprint to follow on within training and and with because when you're passionate about it and it means a lot to you but you're also an overthinker it becomes bigger than than what it is and then all of a sudden the results or your performance become bigger than what they are. Um, and so all of my work now is, uh, un- has been about understanding how do I, within this moment, fully focus on rational concepts of my performance and how I can be at my best within this particular one drill of this training session or within the next 30 seconds of this game or the next minute. And I'm mean, imagining CrossFit is the same, you, especially for something like CrossFit. You got all that time in between events, um, and from my limited ex- limited time of, you might agree or disagree with me from what from what I saw when I went to watch some small scale CrossFit events in Hong Kong. I saw it happening with everyone. They couldn't stay within the moment how to best approach that particular whatever it was handstand walk squats it was it, then it all became about the end result what everyone else was thinking what their 19.3 school was going to be compared to such and such within the mm. gym and they couldn't may i i'm hoping i'm right in saying that. that's kind of what i've seen um and it's no different but i mean i'm still it's still something i've learned so much about and improved on from last year but one of my one of my sounds stupid but the this year I thought right I'm gonna I want to score more goals and to score more goals I'm gonna start taking the team's penalties and I take the penalties you know I've worked loads in the COVID period on my ball striking it's it's got to it's gone unrecognizable from where it's been before I'm gonna take a penalty so not last game two games ago we get a penalty but it scores nil nil and I'm thinking, oh, well, if it was 1-0 or if I'd already scored, I had, I had scored in the first half and it got r- wrongly ruled out for offside. So I know. I know in my head because I've trained on it. And I know that I've actually created myself a rational blueprint to follow. Ball down. I can tell you it now. Ball down. 
five steps, uh, three, uh, five steps backwards, five steps on the spot, one, two, three, kick through the ball, know exactly where it's going. I've got it. I've developed it. But in that moment, I'm thinking to myself, oh, well, it's nil-nil. I've not really taken one. What? So it's, it's still absolutely a work in, it's definitely a work in well, progress. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a good example. You telling that story of something that just happened to me just yesterday, actually. So I went out paddleboarding in, uh, in Deepwater <laughs> Bay. And I just went out by myself because I fancied getting out in the water at the Sunday, nice to get some yeah. nature in. And I, you know, 20 minutes, they, a day. 20 minutes a day, actually, there's actually 40 minutes. So I'm 20 minutes <laughs> in anyway. And uh, I'm new, quite new to paddle boarding. So I'm thinking a little bit about technique, I like yourself, a bit of an overthinker. So rather than just paddle, like, mm. this is a good chance to actually, you know, improve, uh, improve some technical efficiency on my paddle dip and drive. And here I am <laughs> strolling along, making some good speed. Just there's no one else in the water, just, just me in the ocean. Uh, and then out of nowhere, a little speedboat with four women drive past me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, didn't, they probably didn't even see me, but I thought, okay, I've got, oh, I've got eight. They were obviously, four. They were obviously wolf, wolf whistling. I mean, they all had their phones out and we're all zooming <laughs> in the phones. But yeah. So, anyway, the fact that these four girls drive past me immediately I start changing my stroke and in my head I'm thinking <laughs> make this look easy put as little effort in but really impress them with how far you move the board on each panel and what happens fell in <laughs> fell in because the technique went to shit because I was no longer thinking about just being present and enjoying what I was doing I was now thinking on the external validation of what these four girls in a boat next to me were going to think of me my paddleboard was completely ridiculous and I ended up making a complete fool of myself because, yeah, you know, just couldn't even stand on a paddleboard. But it's a, it's a great example of exactly what you're talking about. But, yeah. and, I know, and I know too, because straight away, as soon as I pulled myself back on the board, as they were probably laughing and driving away, I was thinking, <laughs> well, you know why that happened? Because you stopped thinking about yeah. the actual stroke of what you've been doing for 20 minutes very successfully. And you started thinking about what someone else is going to think of you. But it's easier said than done. So what what are the strategies like to someone perhaps who's an athlete or who has this same the same thing happening to them in their professional life or whatever it is they do for their careers you know how do you control the controllables how do you be 100 percent present in what you're doing and how how do you stop you know the, the the opinions or external validation affecting what you're doing then and there I think this again, I, like I like exactly perfectly is as I just alluded to. Certainly, that's something that I haven't mastered, but it's something that I'm so much more conscious of now. And it all really, a lot of it stems from I think probably just as things went on as a player and you gain more experience. But what happened last year was I totally lost all my confidence and my self belief. And when we were in training. I would get like criticism or a tough time off my teammates dur during the session because of, of how they perceived me or how I'd played previously. And so every, if I listened, if you did, what, what would you call it? Like a personality test on, on me. Uh, I'm sure one of the, the key things would be that he values being respected and liked by by peers or his other. I've, I've not done one, but I'm guessing that would come up promptly. So here I am in in a situation where the total opposite is happening, where you know, at any, I I know I know for a fact that they don't value me as a player, and and a very vocal in lay in that, and so I had to develop tools to allow me to still train within that and still try and produce my best within that environment. So what that looked like, that looked, I mean, this is football, you know, this is full football for me. So even within football, someone else would have a totally different mindset or, or a totally different way of doing things. And then when we look at a sport like CrossFit, someone else, would, they, you're going to have a total different thing. But I just looked at, every, I, I needed to know where, where the ball was and I, I had to have a picture of where it was going every opportunity so that I knew the ball's there. I need to start scanning there because I know as soon as I get this ball, I'm touching it that way and then I'm going to release it. So all my talk then became rational about how I was best going to approach this, this 
specific one drill, how I was going to do this and that. And the other thing is that I kind of alluded to there was when you, what I'd learned or what, well, yeah, no, what I, what I learned, especially last year and which, which we'll get on to, I think when we talk, when we contrast the two debuts is yeah. when people criticize you or when people that's either, if you're, they're either going to put piss on your fire or pour fuel on your fire. It's either going to make you rise up, pin your shoulders back and say, no, I'm going to show you and I'll show you exactly what I can do. Or is it, you're going to whew, deflate and crumble and, and, and let them beat you. And your, your choice to how you let that react is, is 100% up to you. Cause some people say, uh, some people say, oh, it doesn't bother me. I just get on with it. And others people say, oh, yeah. But I know because I was someone who it massively affected. And now I am someone who it does nothing but motivate. So I know it can be worked on and it can be trained. And, you, and your reaction to that criticism or feedback is totally up to you. And that was a huge lesson, a huge lesson that I learned and, and something that I've really carried through. So I guess it was double-edged. It really focus me to un and to keep rational and to understand the specific skills and things within my control and secondly it was also about understanding how it motivated me and drove me and how it made me feel inside and it and put me into a feeling where I actually really wanted to no no if someone said you're shit I say right good watch this then not no, yeah, you're probably right. I am shit and go within myself. That's been a, a long journey. And so what, what is the opposite of rational? If like, if you, if you're keeping your rational head on you, is the opposite rational yeah. emotional? Is that, is that where you, you, you take it personally and like, you know, you, you, you want to blurt out an immediate response that's perhaps not, not linked to the situation? Yeah, because, because I think again, that, that, the, Again, I, I don't want to. I don't want to sound like I'm a expert because I'm not. I can only speak from my experience. But in my experience, the mental interpretation then has a physical one. So in that period, that that self-talk, when when say for example the criticism came, the self-talk would then all of a sudden be negative, and then I'd get in a hyper you then becoming hyper anxious and then all I, I guess everyone's been there in it, especially I'd imagine especially in CrossFit where you where it's an individual sport and all the eyes are kind of on you then all of a sudden the mind's working a million miles an hour and so it's, it's so I guess the the mental then leads to the physical response which then only heightens the uh, mm. mental response and you're not you, I guess you're effectively then you're not present because you're thinking about Ah oh, shit! No, he is right, and I'm not good enough for this level. And all you're having all these thoughts on a pitch, where you've got milliseconds to make decisions about how to control the ball, how to how to mark your man, how to, and it would be the same. It would be the same in CrossFit as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, just our last guest, you know, who's a coach in CrossFit, talked about that. You know, he talked about, you know, essentially what you're saying is that that emotional side of us triggers the sympathetic system essentially which then 100 percent has physical effects i mean it increases our tissue yeah. temperature it makes our hands sweat you know it does all yeah. these things that manifest themselves immediately on the body and yeah. that, that detracts from the ability to actually perform in the moment and so what he yeah. talked about was actually incorporating that into training his athletes so for example in the training preparation phase for a competition calling out a random no repetition you know, perhaps obstructing yeah. their ability to compete. So they haven't actually get used and practice like these moments of frustration. And like, yeah. you know, I guess like old oh, David Goggins would say, I know you're a big fan, you know, callousing yeah. the mind. So it doesn't yeah. get affected by those things on game day. Uh, and so, you know, there's yeah. actual, actual physical practices of, of getting his, his athletes used to the process of having to deal yeah. with it and not getting affected by it. Yeah, and that's, I guess, effectively what, when I was kind of alluding to our upbringing, there was no callousing of the mind ever. It didn't exist. No, there was no criticism from teammates. 
you know, just think, you know, if you think back, if there's one time you did a shit pass, no, I didn't say fucking hell, that's da -da, that negative self talk. It didn't exist. So you never prepare yourself. And then all of a sudden you get into this and you've never had that exposure to it in your childhood and growing up and, and whatever. And absolutely, but it's, it's so important. And, but something that, as you say, you can callous your mind. David Goggins, obviously like the most extreme example in the whole world. But uh, yeah, so when I read his book, I took, I took loads from it because I was thinking, yeah, that's the, exactly what it is. It's in those difficulties. Kind of, I think I said it before. It's like when you're in the difficulties, as long as you're learning from them, and you don't use them as an excuse to take shortcuts and start skipping on your processes, and you then start incorporating more processes to better equip with yourself, then you're ultimately a much better athlete. Yeah. Okay. Tell us about your debut with Hubei. So you know this is your first. <laughs> Your first, you know, you're playing in the China yeah. Super League now, you know, and that's like, you know, this is yeah. some of the, the greatest players, some of the biggest contracts, um, and like, yeah. you, know, the, you know, televised around the world, like this is you in the league now. And I know your, yeah. your debut, your first experience probably has had a very lasting impact on you, probably yeah. something you're going to remember forever. And then, you know, what I then want to talk about is how that contrasted to you and your new club now. And how yeah. how that debut went, uh, and what what happened yeah. in between, and, and what have you changed in terms of, in terms of I guess everything your processes, your mindset, and the ability to actually perform on the day. Yeah, um, well, I'll definitely waffle on on this one, but I'll give it my best shot. It's so I at the beginning of two thousand, I think I'd probably give it a little bit of context before my debut because the context probably will explain the debut. So when I arrived. Um, at Hebei, I was, a li I was a little bit unfit. I'd, uh, I'd carried like, not a hernia, but a similar kind of injury. So I hadn't done a lot in the off season. Um, but I arrived, I mean, at that time, might get lost on a, on a couple of CrossFit people, but you had like, Chris Coleman was the manager. He'd just been to the semifinals with Wales and the Euros. You had Mascherano was there. He'd won Champions League. I mean, he'd won literally everything in the game. He was the most capped player in the history of Argentina. Uh, we had Lebetsi who played for all the top teams across Europe. You had, you had guys who played X amount of times for the Chinese national team. But you, all of a sudden, it doesn't matter. All those things don't have an impact on me performing at my best within a training session. If anything, they should make me better because I'm going to say, right, look how good I can be and look how I can show you that. I've, and, and it could be a you know, real source of motivation. But unfortunately, it was a bit daunting. I thought, wow, this is this is big and and this is maybe a bit a, a bit above me i mean like for example i mean i in i think i moved in the 2018 january of 2018 january 2017 i was still playing for typo taking the mtr to train every day and washing my own kit and here i am in dubai in world class training facilities and i'm kind of i can't believe it i can't believe i'm here i can't believe this is absolutely amazing um so i didn't I didn't get a chance under Coleman. Unfortunately, it didn't go great for him. He got sacked. But in just before he lost his job, I'd spent, I got gastroenteritis, so I was sick in hospital. So I had built up a bit of form and I'd stayed consistent to my processes and I got myself, the training was really good there. I got myself in a, a good position. But unfortunately, after four or five days in hospital, I lost four or five, you know, four. 4 kg that I didn't really have to lose at that time um, and I've raced back trying to get my chance but raced back far too quickly without really probably appreciating what being that sick had done to my body physically and mentally um, Coleman got sacked and then from nowhere when the new coach came in he, he gave me my chance so I'd not even I'd, I'd been on the bench once that's it so I'd been maybe about seven games gone I'd, I'd been on the bench once. I'd not played any games. I played a couple of reserve games and not been great. Certainly nothing close to what I know I can play like. And from nowhere, I'm, that's it. I'm getting my debut. So in, in the training, in the build-up to the game, I'd, uh, I'd been, I was about, about uh, kind of like a little bit I alluded to before, total bag of nerves, was nervous on the ball, was making mistakes, people getting on my case. Um, but I'd always played my best 
in big games. My best games, whether even when I was playing in the UK and on league, my best games come in cup finals. In, and then my, one of my best games was for Hong Kong. And generally speaking, my best games had been for Hong Kong in, in front of big crowds. In, and so I thought, don't worry, I'll get through it. And I know once the game goes, then, then, I'll, then I'll be fine. And it just, it never, it never got there. I just was so anxious. Every time I was on the ball, everything was racing a million miles an hour. Um, I, ultimately, like the week of training was a total representation of then how the game went. I had no confidence, no self-belief. And I was, and the best way to describe it was I was coming from a total position of, I don't, don't fuck this up. Don't make a mistake. Just get, you know, play safe, play safe and don't make a mistake. And, and then the second half kicks off. It's nil, nil. I've, I've got just about got through the first half. The ball gets played back to me. I kind of half, I don't even, I still to this day don't know what happens. I kind of slip slash miscontrol the ball slash try and play it. And I effectively do nothing more than kind of fall backwards as I pass the ball straight to their striker who runs through and scores one nil. And then it's like everything that you don't want has just happened. And then we're chasing the game. You know, it was getting to, it was, I mean, I can laugh about it now, but you know, it was getting to a point where I was in so much space and my teammates were like, were actively like not passing me the ball, but I was happy that they weren't passing me the ball at the same time. You know, they were probably doing me a favor. I lasted till about the 75th minute. Um, and, and then I, I got substituted off. And I remember I, um, Helen, Helen was there. She'd, I think she'd extended her stay in China. She'd come, um, she stayed, traveled about two hours in the car to come. And I remember we just sat, I was, we were sat in the back of this car. I was just crying my eyes out. Just like, because you'd, you'd put in all that work. You you Because that was after, when I was playing in the first division, I was always saying, I'll, I'll get moved to Super League. I'll play in the Super League. It was my goal. And then you get there, you've done all this work, you followed all these processes. and then. This is how it's gone. And I said, I said, I'll never, I'll never play for Hebei again. And I, I will, this will be with me forever. I mean, in the end, I, I managed to work at that. I came back and played bits and pieces towards the end of the season. Um, but that was the, when, when we were speaking previously about, you know, that kind of perception and how I was treated by my teammates, that was already starting and that's the first game that you play. And then the, the kind of the, the die set then as to um, how things are going to proceed. So that debut and, and, and how it went and then how, how challenging it made trade. Because then even when I came on next, eventually with maybe six games to go to the, for the season, I then start coming back off the bench again, but it's always from a position of, you know how it went last time. Do not make another mistake. Just keep it simple. Don't mess it up, and 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 you'll be all right. And so I, and the the, the crazy thing was is that some of the best games I've played were for Hong Kong towards the end. Of, so I made my debut for Hebei in the May, maybe May of 2019. And then in October, no, October and November, Hong Kong played Iran, who at that time had a, a striker who was playing for Zen at St. Petersburg, playing in the Champions League, and played against Bahrain, who, you know, were a really good side. And I was playing some of the best football I'd, I'd ever played. Playing totally to, in, you know, I'd come out of that environment. And then I'd go back to Hebei after and, not, <laughs> and, and perform perform poor, poorly again but I think going off that what that debut and then the, the subsequent it taught me everything about I guess what we a lot of what we spoke about before it taught me everything about keeping rational keeping present within that moment 
and not thinking, right, oh, no, I've made another mistake there. He's not going to try and take me off. This, is, oh, this isn't how I imagine my debut is going to go. Uh, oh, I'm not going to get another chance in games going gone on. Staying, and, and totally transforming how, how I then took criticism and how I used it for fuel. And that kind of brings me perfectly to my debut this season because what happened was I think I'd learned so much, but it just wasn't through no fault of theirs. You know, as I said, you know, I take all the responsibility. It just wasn't working at a base. I had an opportunity to go to another team in the first division um, called Shanxi. I went there in January, spent a few days training with them. I thought I'd done pretty well, certainly better than what they had there um and after maybe four days I got a knock on the door from the translator and he just said the coach doesn't want you you can go so I'd packed all my bags thought that was it for me I was I was I was leaving Hebei I was going to join this team on loan for the season um and pretty quickly after what four or five days I was back with Hebei and uh it was a bit sad really because I had two big suitcases with all my stuff so I'd have to pay extra baggage to bring them there to start this trial. And now I was going back, paying the extra baggage again with my leg, with my tail between my legs back to her bay. But as it transpired, the team where they'd rejected me on that trial, that's who we played in our first game this season. And so in that, all that period during COVID and when I was doing my own individual training, it was never that coach was right. He should have, maybe he was right maybe i am not good enough for that level maybe i maybe i'm it was i'm gonna get my chance and i'm gonna give it and i'm gonna give him a massive fuck you and prove to him that he was wrong to do and that's kind of exactly what i've been talking about is that negative situation or his perception that i am not good enough for that team is not going to hamper my confidence it's only going to fuel me to get better and and to push me to prove him wrong and get fast forward. Who's our first game against that team, Shanxi, where the coach has rejected me 10 minutes. Then I, so all those things that we spoke about, because I've always played defender my whole career, but since I've come to this team, um, the coach has asked me to play striker in, in a few of the games. And I find out the coach wants me to play striker. So I've, I've never, ever started a game as striker in my career. But for this game against the coach that's, that, that's told me to do one in January, it's the first time I'm ever going to play up front. But all those lessons I learned, keep rational. You know, all I did, I had a notebook. Okay. I didn't start panicking. Oh, well, it's never going to work now. I was going to prove him wrong, but now I'm a, now I'm a defender, but now they put me in a striker. And the, I said, no, this is where my strengths are. This is what I'm going to do. Kept it rational. I'm going to win all my headers. I'm going to play on this. Da, da, da. And then 10 minutes in, cross into the box and I scored. And ran off celebrating and was pointing at him on the bench and saying uh, a few expletives. But I guess it was a great, it was a great journey between the two debuts. And, and it was, and thrown into that, how different both debuts were, was also the added fact that that coach had deemed me not good enough for his team in the January. And how I then reacted to that bit of criticism and how I was able to use it as fuel is when I was training in within, within kind of the, the COVID and lockdown period. And then ultimately I never, it never once entered my mind about, no, maybe he's right. Maybe I am. And it never knocked me off my track. It only fueled me to play better when eventually the, the game came and I, and I managed to get the goal and, and play actually really well at the game. Um, and, and I've spoke to a load of people from, staff and players from their team since who've said you know the coach was wrong he he should have signed you and so interesting in hearing that is a part is a part of your this whole fueling of your fire to want to prove this coach wrong is a part of that not not being rational is not is a part of that your emotional side you know like you're using something else that's outside of your control you know, you not making this team and wanting to prove it wrong, prove this guy wrong. Is that not partly yeah. taking you out of the present moment and just focusing on being the best you can be and controlling the control? Yeah, 
no, it's a really, it's a, I guess it's a really good point because I guess what would what we'd be saying is what would happen if the first game wasn't against that coach. Mm. Would I then have had the same level of motivation and, and so on and so forth? So there's a lot of stuff out of my control. So I guess and what you're saying there is right in that you shouldn't you shouldn't have things that are outside of your control affecting motivation levels and whatever. But I guess I wanted to reference it with respect to it was a negative and that bit turning a negative into a positive mm. in terms of that. Um, and, and, and ensuring that say, for example, when he did say no, it wasn't then when our first game was against him, it was worry about, Oh, maybe he was right. I don't want to mess this up, and I'm only going to prove him right in, in, with respect to that. Mm. Yeah, I guess I guess that was the alter. It was a fuel for your fire, but as you said, at the end of the day, you still went back to your processes, and you know, if you knew that you executed those, you you do your best performance. So, on that note, uh, could you run us through like your t- a typical day of what your processes look like? Perhaps like. You know, you obviously got training days, you got game days, but I I know because again we've spoken about this a lot in the past. I know you're very meticulous about the processes, whether it's the journaling or it's the visualization or it's the yeah. pre-training, the the post-training, the the pre-bedtime routines. And you know, you've always reached out to me and asked for my thoughts on on like new things that you can add to your processes to make you a better athlete yeah. or a better a better person. So. Maybe you could just run run us through what that what that typically looks like. Yeah, I got and I mean this is just this is just for me, and I think maybe it all depends within the confines of of the team training and what that team training is per day. Um, but individually, things that I'll always do. So I always I'm not sure these are all my, <laughs> my top secrets. They're all a bit cringe as well. So no, I'll have to um, I have to get them out there. So. I took loads from uh, the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. Amazing. So there's a yeah, there's a period of um, towards the end of episode seven when they when they talk about whether he was a nice guy and and if that you know his drive to win and succeed you know mm. put all those other factors to a cost. It's, it's about a two minute something. I just took, I just take loads from it, take loads from his work ethic and, and loads from that. So I always, I've watched that every morning when I brush my teeth. Then I have to say three things that I'm grateful for. And then I meditate for five minutes again, working on trying to stay present. Um, I'm really fortunate that like a, a very good friend works at a Premier League club as a strength and conditioning coach. So he's prescribed me my own individual gym program that I do by myself before any team training starts which should last for about maybe 30, 30, 40 minutes. And then I always try to spend 10 minutes after every training session working on a specific area that I want to improve technically. Um, then I will have positive self-talk when I get back to my room after training for about six and a half minutes. I listen to the same song every time positive self-talk trying to what what um, is what is what is the process of positive self-talk i just talk about my strengths what i can do what i have done in terms of trading trying to build a greater grit in terms of that kind of confidence and self-belief whether that's right or wrong or you know scientifically works uh, that's what i've done and, and and it helps me and you said you said um, you, there's a song at six and a half minutes. What's that? It's Vengeance. I can't remember who sings it, but just just one particular song. And then I will always listen to that whilst doing the self talk. Then mm-hmm. I will. I have a like an Excel sheet on my phone again with regards to staying rational. Where I have a, I'll break down training into specific technical points, whether that be defending, attacking, mentally. And I think so for each each point, I give myself a score of ten for a grand for a total of one hundred and fifty. So I force myself to rationally reflect on training as opposed to emotionally reflect on things outside of my control. So it's all about what I did well, will continue to do well, I should have done better. So there's fifteen different points where I score myself 
out of 10 on that. And then I stretch and roll every night for 30 minutes. And then most nights I'll be in a Norma Tech for 45 minutes. And we'll always visualize tech, tech. I'll do technical vision, like tech, seeing myself correctly perform techniques before I sleep, whether that be at night or during the day as well. I'm a huge believer in, the, in napping and, and cheese and toasties. Then, <laughs> that, that's, I was going to say all that. And that stuff's gone, unfortunately. That's been my biggest one recently is trying to eradicate any treats and sugars and stuff like that out of my diet. So then within that, you've got, you might have extra gym sessions depending on how many games you've got and stuff like that. Or, and then whatever tra team training you have as well. I listen yeah, to I mean, amazing, I get on the high performance podcast. Um, the other day, they also had Phil Neville. He taught, he spoke about Cristiano Ronaldo and he said that when they actually broke down what he did in a day with his team, it was about an hour, an hour, you know, in that actual team training. But everything, you know, and everything else. And it, so in total, you're hopefully looking at about five to six hours a day, additional work outside yeah, of the team environment. I think just goes to show just like, just an uh, amazing amount of dedication that goes in that, you know, the fans, the audience, the people on the outside probably never see when it comes to professional athletes. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and to be honest, I wish it was, I think if I'd have arrived in China earlier, um, I'd, have, I'd have got my own personal trainer. I'd have got my own physio and, and kind of a bit like what probably top, I call them real footballers, but you know, players playing at elite level at your in Europe and stuff probably have they have now, and individual sports people have as well. If I'd had a bit more time and a and a bit more money behind it, I would, I would love to invest it in that as well. Invested even more into into the processes outside of the, the team environment. Nice. All right, Andy, well, I want to finish up this podcast just with a, well, one question to start because I think you'd have an interesting answer on it. Which is right. if you could if you could speak to your twenty year old self, what would you tell him? Have a clear goal, have a clear goal of what you want because you got. I think it's funny. I've, there's so many. Not so. Many, sounds like you're trying to accept an award for an Oscar, but it's like so many people that you you want to. You can't do anything by yourself. Is what I'm trying to say. Basically, you need the right people to come in. I mean, like I was so fortunate enough during. Um, the lockdown period where I worked, I found, you know, randomly living, living back in, in the UK in Preston. Um, there's a technical coach who did one-on-one -on -one training and he'd worked at Man United for years and years. And so ran how I've been, you know, it was, it all came because the guy, the joiner who was working, doing work on our house, he was coaching his son. And he was like, oh, well, maybe Andy should go to him. You know, next thing COVID happens, next thing I've spent three months working with him every day, pretty much, and totally transforming my technique. But these people, yourself or whoever come into your life, but they come into your life when you know where, where you want to get to, when you have a clear goal. And that was probably my biggest problem growing up. And, and certainly when, if I look back at, when I wasn't really achieving anything and I definitely wasn't really achieving anything football wise, it was, it was because I had no clear goal or direction of where I wanted to get to because, and then when you do have the clear goal, like you say, people start coming into your life and the, the processes start forming, but the processes and the people never come into your life. If, if, if the goal isn't there. Mm, love it. All right, Andy. Well, I think, uh, I think we're going to, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of the uh, the tagline "Trust the process." And <laughs> Might have heard it trust, once or twice. Yeah. Trust in the process is all about you know the importance of having a goal, but once the goal is set, to then investing 
you know the time and energy into the actual process yeah. which is the daily the daily steps that you need to you need to do to accomplish a goal and in that process it's it's not about focusing on the outcome because the more you focus on the outcome the more it brings you out of the present and so it's yeah. just about you know it is really important i think a goal is super important and i think admittedly as well um you know i've a lot a large part of my life i've i've gone through without setting a goal um but yeah. not not necessarily to say that has hampered me uh, you know there's definitely just been periods where I've, I've just gone off i guess pure passion you know fueled just to yeah. want to do something because i really enjoy it and i guess that is that probably is a representation of, a, of being present because i just do want to do what makes me happy and what brings me fulfillment but then at the same yeah. time when you don't when you don't have a goal you can find yourself as i did you know working extremely hard day to day but not actually moving the needle anywhere you know, yeah you, 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 you end up yeah like very close to um goals is one that is the word you just said there is is passion mm. um because without i'm fortunate that i'm i think that's what i probably i'm passionate about football and so it is easy for me to go to the gym to not like there's a supermarket here and every night everyone goes and gets an ice cream or soft drinks or whatever. And when you're passionate about something, you, it, it is easier to make those, sac- they're not, they're almost not sacrifices. Um, and now uh, I've been lucky enough to have a little son. And I always, we always joke Helen and I to say, you know, what happens if he does ballet or what happens if he wants to do CrossFit? And I say, well, I'm never going to force him to do anything because you're never going to achieve anything if you're never passionate about it. And I think, I guess, in the course of this conversation, people will think, I don't know, I'm, I'm hoping they will think he's, uh, wow, he's, he's very resilient and he's, and, he, and he's worked really hard. But you're only ever going to be resilient about something that you're passionate about. You know, yeah. I remember clear as day once my mum said you know I think it's time when things weren't working out in Hong Kong when I was playing Hong Kong my mum said I think you should get you should get a real job I think it's time you get a real job and I was thinking no like but I mean at this, like now I in my spare time I try to learn Mandarin I'm not passionate about it I just think it's good to use your brain and 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 to not waste your time watching series or and I you know it might come in useful in the future. But if some if my mum was saying to me, Andy, I think it's time you quit Mandarin or there's something else going on here, you don't have to do this lesson, I'd pretty quickly not be doing that lesson. I'd pretty quickly so without that passion, you're never gonna have the resilience to persist and deal with the setbacks and the failures that ultimately, whether it be owning a CrossFit gym, being a professional sportsman, doing anything you'll you'll never you'll never do it and so i just hope that when why i alluded to zach my son is like when he gets to an age all i will help him to do is just to find what he is passionate about and what like even if it was i don't know cutting hair as long as he was passionate about it he will then have the resilience and the work ethic to become the best that that and and that and that's so important as well yeah nice good one good one to finish on all right andrew well man, i want to thank you very much for your time yeah um too long. No, 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 absolutely not don't know not long enough, um, we, <laughs> not could long enough. And, we could sit here and talk all day about this yeah. kind of stuff but mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you in the show really no, appreciate you your time the glasses that you've got that you've got on well, yeah, these are, they're going to help me drift off into a quiet sleep and hopefully bring, bring me back in the green of my whoop tomorrow. So they're an essential blue, blue light glasses if anyone is uh, listening to this and wondering what he's alluding to. Uh, highly recommend the investment. Um, Andrew, thank you very much for your time, my friend. No, thank uh, you for having it's me. It's been great. And, uh, yeah. and good, luck. Hey, good luck with the season. Thanks. Keep in touch.